food controls how you feel, mm -hmm. it controls your diet, of course, and it controls your overall well-being. Cooking in the Kitchen with Leroy Butler. Next on Black Nouveau. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dapper. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. This week, we'll revisit former Packers great and current chef Leroy Butler. Author Doris Cope would join us to discuss a freed woman's dance, a personal and compelling story of how she survived neglect and abuse and found her way to healing. But we begin with two segments that shatter some of the myths of American slavery. Dr. Rex Ellis uses storytelling as a means of teaching African American history. He'll share a story with us in a few minutes. But first, we want to look back at an exhibit that shed light on Dave the Potter, artist, poet, and slave. slave. Our Everett Marshburn has that story. For Mrs. Jones, this was made for Mrs. Jones. Two clay artists spanning three centuries meet at the Milwaukee Art Museum's exhibit to speculate darkly. Produced in cooperation with the Chipstone Foundation, the exhibit reinterprets the works of 19th century slave and artisan Dave Drake, who's also known as Dave the Potter, through the eyes of Chicago artist Theaster Gates, Jr. My name is Dave. My name is Dave. Dave, um, pretty simply, was um, part of a whole team of uh, black craftsmen who uh, were born into slavery and uh, were given, were trained in a set of skills. I mean, Dave happened to be both a uh, printmaker and typesetter and potter, among other things. And uh, uh, he was apparently the, the most prolific and the most astute potter um, on, the, on the Miles Landrum plantation. And as a result, was given a fair amount of freedom to make the kinds of works that he wanted to, including the ability to write uh, small couplets, small poems on the shoulders of his pots, and also to sign his pots. So the reason we know so much about him, he's so identifiable, is because he had signature, which um, so often for, for, for the labor class in general um, was not possible. Dave's ability to read and write reflects skills that history tells us most slaves did not possess. Gates hopes the exhibit will help viewers question history. I always assumed that if I saw it on a wall or if I read it in a book, that that was truth. And what I've come to realize is that uh, while the facts that are in books might be true, and sometimes not, that there are also multiple perspectives about what history means and, and how things get interpreted. And so uh, a war that was a, su a success for some is probably a war that was a, a, a huge devastation for others. And, uh, and so I think that I feel finally empowered to add another perspective on the historical objects that are around me or that I find interesting. The exhibit is a multimedia presentation, with the centerpiece being an actual clay pot made by Dave. On the shoulder of the pot, it says uh, something like, uh, this one made with, for pork or beef, uh, go find Scott, he'll want his piece, you know, this kind of. And that, that, um, that Dave had a sense that the pot would be used for meat storage. And, uh, you know, salted meats was, you know, was the way you preserve things. You know, you dig a hole, you put a pot in, you put a lid on it. And, you know, from meat storage to fermentation to water storage, I think Dave's big vessels, um, they were to be used. Gates discovered his interest in pottery quite by accident. I was studying urban planning at, at Iowa State and uh, I needed a, a design class. I didn't want to take a drawing class. I was pretty good with my hands. And I found myself uh, in the middle of, with my bow tie on and my fancy urban planner slacks in a, in a pottery studio, um, completely unfamiliar with getting dirty ever. And uh, that class went well. And by the end of the year that I, I did that, uh, the slacks were off, the tie was off. I had dreadlocks and a nose ring and I had decided that I was going to very quickly abandon urban planning for the life of an artist. <laughs> Gates' interest in pottery led him to Japanese art and culture, and eventually to Dave the Potter. 
all of these elements are included in the multimedia presentation. One of the things that I, I had shared with Chipstone in the Milwaukee Art Museum was that um, part of the reason that maybe some populations don't come to museums is because they're not invited. And that maybe I could do uh, this ambassadorial work of um, not only inviting people, but really having a need for them to exist inside of my exhibition. That that need would compel them, hopefully, to want to be a part of it and then want to see themselves reflected uh, in, the, in the product, in the, the, the byproduct of our engagement together. And so uh, I uh, reached out to my Facebook friends in Chicago and reached out to some African American churches and other uh, singing communities here in Milwaukee and, and told folk, you know, I need a choir that I can bring together that can sing uh, this music that will help amplify the historical narrative of Dave the Potter. The video is the first rehearsal of the gospel choir singing uh, I Want to Sell My Wares. And Sell My Wares is, uh, is, is a kind of anthem for me and Dave, you know, that, that uh, Dave wanted to sell his wares and, and I wanted to. Dr. Ellis, welcome and thank you for joining us on Black Nouveau. My pleasure. What prompted your interest in storytelling and performance art as a way of explaining history? I have always been interested in performing arts. It has always been, I think, a way to express all of the various facets of my personality and myself that I've always wanted to do. So I always had the sort of background in the performance, but it was the teaching of the history that really moved me toward storytelling in a way that I hadn't uh, experienced before. And much of that was a result of just frustration, of not being able to get beyond the, you know, I, I work at Colonial Williamsburg and so you're stuck from 1700 to 1799, you sort of mm -hmm. can't get out of the 18th century and that focuses from the African American experience, it focuses on slavery. That's something folk don't want to talk about. That's something that's so controversial until it can be, it can be a, a deal breaker in terms of people wanting to learn about that history. And much of it has to do with the way historians tend to talk about that period of time. Everything is facts and figures and statistics. Everything Everything is 20% of the population did this, 10% of the population did that. Everything revolves around that and this nomenclature of slave. Um, and so much of what I wanted to do was to remove the sort of formality and begin to talk about three-dimensional human beings, individuals who were caught up in the system of slavery so that I could talk about them as husbands, talk about them as wives, talk about them as, as people who, who, had, who ran the gamut of emotions. And storytelling, I think, allows you to do that. And everybody loves a good story. I've always said, it's hard to hate somebody whose story you know. <laughs> You can do That's it, true. but it's hard. That's true. Much of your work is focused on making history understandable for everyday citizens. Do you feel people don't relate to history? I think people probably don't see history as something that's as exciting as um, American Idol. Uh, they don't see history in uh, a dynamic form. They see it, oh, uh, here we go with another fact, and here we go with another figure, here we go with another date, here we go with another, and they don't see the mystery of history, they don't see the dynamics of history, and so for me, storytelling is one of the ways, not the only way, mm -hmm. but certainly one of the ways that can add dynamism and that can add relevance mm -hmm. to those who are sort of, fo not forced, but those who are looking at the history, uh, uh, the historical narrative, the historical environment, or a historical place. You've studied uh, colonial slavery. What are the most popular misconceptions Americans have about slavery? Slaves were simply victims of their surroundings who did not have the wherewithal to improve their situation. It was something that was forced on them by Europeans and so they were simply victims and had no real way of improving their lot. You're going to do a piece for us. What's the name of the story you're going to perform for us? It's called Old Ben, and hopefully it'll give you some idea of what I mean by how one uses the system to their advantage 
if they believe there's something about that system that they can use to in some way move them toward freedom. Let me see here now, let me see here the story of the rabbit, there's a story of the fox, there's a story of Anansi. I think I'm going to tell you the story about Titus. You see, Titus was a slave boy. He worked along here with Robert Carter. I'm talking about Robert King Carter, the man down here with all the land and all the money. Now, Robert King Carter used him as a, as a, as a, as a slave, but he was a doctor. Matter of fact, he knew more about roots and herbs than many folk around here. Fact. He knew so much about roots and herbs until the governor during that time, his name was Gooch. Well, Gooch wasn't the governor. Gooch was the lieutenant governor. The governor was Hamilton over in England, too lazy to come over here and do his job. So he, well, that's another story. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Gooch offered him his freedom if and he was to tell them his secrets of roots and herbs. Well, when Tom went back home to tell this to Titus, Titus got all excited about it. He said, well, I know you're going to tell him. I know you're going to tell him because you're going to get your freedom. Tom looked at Titus like he was crazy. And then he decided he would tell Titus the story of the slave boy and the skeleton head. Seems the slave boy was walking through the woods one night and he come upon the skeleton head. Well, he walked on past it and he thought, he heard it speak. So he walked up to it, and sure enough, the skeleton head said, Mouth brought me here, and it's going to bring you too. Well, the slave boy was so excited about hearing a skeleton head speak, he ran on home to tell his master about it. His master was laying up in the bed all nice and toasty, ready to go to sleep. Slave boy runs in, tells him about the skeleton head. Well, the master, he gets excited too. He's superstitious too. So he puts on his pants and he puts on his shirt and he puts on his shoes. He decided he would leave his wig at home. You know what's nighttime, will nobody going to see him know how. So they're going on down through the woods. Now as they're going down through the woods, the master says to the slave boy, he says, now listen, if you are not telling me the truth, this is the last time you will ever tell a lie. Slave boy didn't pay that no mind. He knew he heard it. Sure enough, they get to the clearing. Sure enough, there's a skeleton head. Slave boy, <clears throat> hello, head, nothing. I said, hello, head, nothing. I said, wait, wait, wait just a minute. I said, hey, and just about that time, the master picks up a branch, swings it across the slave boy's head, knocks him down, dead. As the master throws the branch back into the woods and walks on back toward his house, the skeleton head says, I told you, mouth brought me here and it was going to bring you too. So you see, Titus, if you want to live in this life, you don't say all you see and you don't tell all you know. I like that one. Meet Doris Cope, a successful My professional from Seattle, Washington, who today life. celebrates life. That was not always the case. In her book, A Freed Woman's Dance, which she said is a healing tool, she tells the story of her childhood abuse. If we talk about the economic uh, setting first. We can say that I was down south in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we were growing up in an area called Churchville, and Churchville was founded by the slaves uh, right after Reconstruction, and it was called Churchville because there was church on every corner, and um, it was priests civil rights days and our family had a little business in the community and they lost the lease on the business when I was nine and they moved that business into our house. What kind of business was it? And it was um, what we would call a juke joint or they called it a splow house and in that house we sold moonshine liquor, we sold chitlins, we sold fried fish and there was it was just a bar. 
And so my parents moved their customers and their arguments and that cigarette smoke and all of that stuff into our house at uh, when I was nine. And when you mix all the things I just named with a little curious little girl, you got a poisonous combination in the form of child abuse, uh, sexual abuse. I was nine when my mother's customers started molesting me. How did you get past your childhood pain? Well, it was a process. It wasn't an event. Um, I ultimately joined the Air Force and the Air Force saved my life and that for the first time I had the opportunity to get education so education was a tool out. I had uh, psychological care or access to it. Um, I just went and talked to old ladies. I had a friend who was 85 and I sat on her, her couch in addition to having the formal uh, care. So, uh, and then finally, when I got to seminary just a couple of years ago, I recognized the fa fact that this type of pain, there is no statute of limitations around that, that I had a right, even though my hair is silver now, to own that pain and, and clearly, clearly to get through it. And so uh, the writing itself was a healing stream. And is that how you, how did you heal yourself? Is that what you did? Yes, in the in the writing, I, I was able to go back and revisit the brave little girl who used to be me. I was uh, I I was always uh, ashamed of the fact that I used to um, be very dirty and unkempt and no dental care, no care of any any type. And so I was able to go back and embrace that little girl for the way that she had dreamed of getting out of that situation and how life just opened up and that little girl stepped forward and claimed her own right to health and well-being. How do you and have you encouraged people that they too can survive their pain? Absolutely. As an example, um, three weeks ago I was speaking before a group of 65 women and most of them were African American women, although there were uh, several Caucasian women in attendance. And I read three or four excerpts from the book and the host opened the floor up so that other women could come forward and there was such an outpouring. There was people were crying for themselves and for their grandchildren even. And um, there was one woman who ended up just vomiting and throwing up all of this pain. And that helped me know that A, I had done the right thing in writing the book, but B, that it is a, an, a huge encouragement to people to speak out as the first point of healing. I was surprised by the way this book was written. It wasn't in your face. It wasn't hostile. How did you come up with that style? Well, a um, couple things. I wanted not to be such a historian. I wanted to really give the reader some sense of how life was. And so while these other things were going on, there was a culture, there was a neighborhood, there was there were parents, there were children. And so I wanted to he let the reader hear how that culture um, evolved and how we, we all evolved in that culture. And so I wanted to humanize the statistics around uh, abuse. One in four girls is abused before she's 18 and one in six boys is abused. And so I wanted to make the story um, approachable for people who are uh, still suffering. So I decided to take the, take the uh, reader inside our neighborhood. The title of Freed Women's Dance means what? It means the determination to claim all that is human, all that is joyful, all that is rich within each one of us. And every, every woman, every person has this beautiful humanity 
in them. And sometimes we cover it up with things, material things, and sometimes it's stifled with pain. And so a freed woman's dance is the result of moving into your own inner treasures and celebrating them. I grew up in the inner city and being in a, a small apartment with five kids and your mother, somebody has to take these duties, washing clothes, cooking and things of that sort. But with me it was a little different, Robin, because I had a disease called club feet. And I couldn't run and jump like the normal kids. I was in a wheelchair. And I couldn't do a lot of the other stuff. So my mom, one day, she, she came to me. She said, hey, you want to try to scramble some eggs? I said, well, sure. So I went to doing that. At nine years old, I was making the bacon and the toast and gradually getting into other things. Until at one point, when I was 10 years old, my mom would give my sister, Vicky the grocery list, short. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, she basically told her, let Mr. Butler, she called me Mr. Butler, let him cook it when you buy it. So she'd sit on the counter and left everybody got out of the kitchen. And when they come back in an hour, the food was ready. So at 10 years old, I was cooking for five or six people. So it graduated all the way till now, and I love it. And it controls, food controls how you feel. Mm -hmm. It controls your diet, of course, and it controls your overall well-being. We all know you're a former uh, Green Bay Packer, so what did you eat to stay in shape? That's a good question because your metabolism is a little different. You know, when I played um, for 12 years, I was the smallest strong safety in the league, and I wanted to put on some muscle, and I ate a lot of proteins, mm -hmm. low carbs. And then I kind of graduated into Southern because I'm from the South. In the off season, you can eat the macaroni and cheese, the neck bones, the oxtail, yeah, but during the season, you eat more healthy stuff, fruits, vegetables, and certain types of food. But since I've been retired, now you gotta watch your weight even more because now diabetes come in, high blood pressure, cholesterol, Strokes. and that's why I thought this show would be perfect for that. Okay. Well, what are you going to cook for us today? Well, today is gonna to be very, very fast and very healthy. And we're gonna make the overall best salad because it has everything in it that we need. And it's, when you're an African-American male, we skip a lot of stuff. We just get right to the meat. Yeah. <laughs> but today we're going to force men and women to use the right proper thing. So what we're going to do is start out with some turkey. We're going to use some turkey. And you can use chicken as well. And I know, to me, I like a grilled chicken salad. I don't necessarily eat a turkey salad. But the turkey, to me, adds the healthy flavor of it. And we're going to mix it with a lot of the fruit enzymes and things of that nature and give you a great taste. Okay. So the first thing I like to do, Robin, is the turkey is pretty much already ready. So we want to brown it okay. so it's quick. Because with my kids, they always talk about making stuff quick. So, so Leroy, do you, do you eat salads a lot? Is that a part uh, of your daily diet? Not traditionally, but when you want to be healthy, you have to incorporate some kind of green. So that's why we got our salad with you know, some spinach, lettuce, and things of that nature. And the good thing about this particular recipe, I'm going to attempt, well, I will, <laughs> I'm going to brown the turkey as well as make the salad dressing, kind of a honey mustard type dressing. Okay. And it's really fast. So, this is, what so I'll this do. is a hot and cold salad. Yes, yes, absolutely. And the good thing about that is it, it sends that flavor to your tongue saying, give me more. You know, so. And that's what we want. Up. Right. So you had a particular health benefit from this salad, correct? Yes, absolutely. Because eating this salad, my cholesterol came down 20 points. I ate it twice a week for like, give or take a couple months. And I saw it decline. And my doctor, who's a woman, by the way, she thought it was very interesting. And I told her what I was doing. I was putting all the good things together and having a salad. So she thought it was good. That is good news. Yeah, so. And the good thing good. about it, too, is... I'm trying something that a lot of people may not want to try because a lot of people are allergic to certain types of fruits. So you have to get the good fruits that you like. And right. these are the ones that I like. So, okay. Have you studied so, nutrition? You know, I almost had to. When I played for the Packers, they brought in a nutritionist and she would tell us what was good for our bodies. And she would also tell us what was bad for us. And we didn't always listen. Right. 
So <laughs> add in some peppers, a little pineapple juice, a little honey. There we go. You have a, a cookbook coming out, correct? Absolutely. And I think the good thing about this cookbook is it's a lot of recipes that are really fast. And it's for people who want to cook, but who are scared to do it. So if you can follow by each step, it's a gradual process. And after a while, you're not worried about if somebody likes it yes. because you put love in your pots. So you say, well, oh, I so know there's something like to that cooking yes, with love. Yes. You got to take your time and you got to understand that you're putting something in somebody else's body that you will put in yours. Mm -hmm. So if you, and you also have to understand that, you know, food makes people happy. So when you call somebody and say, hey, look, well, I should call Gilbert or Santana or Brett or Reggie White, say, hey, I'm cooking, they're over there. They're over there. Yeah, they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned to do something to make people happy and cooking has a lot to do with that. In a nutshell, Leroy, what type of foods would you recommend that uh, people have in their diet who are susceptible to stroke or diabetes or heart disease? A lot of fruits and vegetables. Okay. And that helps with me. So, mm -hmm. oh, and guess what? It's ready. Oh, it's done. Mm -hmm. So, you want to put this on last because it's a hot and cold salad. Okay. So, you got your raspberries, you got your peaches, okay, strawberries. So, very colorful. Very colorful. You got your pineapples as well as the juice. Apples, some pears. It's getting high. Yep, there you go. And next, you put the turkey right on top of that, oh, like that. That looks delicious. Yep, and the last thing you want to do, Robin, is get you some pineapple juice that's left. And just okay. go right around the sides like that. There you go. Oh, that looks great, Leroy. Pineapple turkey salad. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us today. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night and thanks for watching.